Let it never be said that this show and its creator do not follow through on a promise. Perhaps you will recall two episodes ago when I explained we would be launching into a lengthy series of episodes about the origins of magic users in Dungeons & Dragons, because one of you asked us about it, and I'm nothing if not eager to please for ratings and reviews, and most especially, support on buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback. It all seemed simple enough at the time. All that was asked for was a few episodes on the three or four D&D character classes we hadn't done yet, and you can't get an easier and more direct request than that, can you? Of course you can, because any kind of request so easily made about such an obvious hole in our catalog must have some sort of reason behind it, and indeed, such was the case. As explained in the first episode of this series, the reason we hadn't done them yet was the necessity of covering such a huge amount of information regarding the history of magic, the history of magic in D&D, &D, and the way these two things interact was more than daunting. It was very nearly impossible to fit into our previous format. There was just so much that was too much, and the intertwining of information, influences, and interpretations of even the most fundamental information that could be treated as fact was well beyond the scope of the things we would and could do in any kind of reasonable episode length at the time. Fortunately, as things went along and the show evolved, it gradually became more likely that we could find a way to fit such things into our format and handle much more complex topics than the usual one-shot ignorance-fighting info injection we used to produce was capable of. Now, we can inoculate you against all sorts of silly ideas, terrible misapprehensions, and wrong-headed justifications by getting you to sit down comfortably with the warm beverage of your choice and slipping on some headphones for 20 minutes to half an hour or more. Which is how, in answering the original request, we helped make you proof against the idea that magic is just technology you don't understand, that all magic is basically the same, and that we know all there is to know about the history of magic. We explained away Clark's third law as inadequate to our understanding of magic, especially since he wasn't talking about magic at the time. We discussed the distinction between the two basic kinds of magic, divine magic, also called theurgy, which relies on the will of some sort of higher power, and thaumaturgy, or the magic of the individual's own will. And because it doesn't have a clearly defined beginning, let alone middle and end, the origins of magic are prehistoric in nature, and therefore largely unknown to anyone. Along the way, we discussed why the cup and balls trick is really the litmus test of professional performance magicians, how there were only three original classes in the first D&D &D and why one of them was a catch-all category, why we were working with only one of the two basic magic categories, why dividing magic up other ways was possible but ill-advised, why nothing about a discussion of magic is simple, and then, finally, we got to Mesopotamia and bowls, and Egypt and the Book of the Dead, and why they aren't where magic started, but were definitely where we were going to start. All of which has left me very worn out and tired, a bit sluggish and under the weather, as if some sort of illness were coming over me. You know the feeling. So tired, so achy, and just on the cusp of catching a cold. And of course, you know the remedy as well. A nice hot bowl of Jewish penicillin. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. We'll come back to that Jewish penicillin remark in a few minutes, but first, I'm going to acknowledge that here is where the distinction between theurgy and thaumaturgy really gets blurry. There's no avoiding it. See, the Mesopotamian and Egyptian people who we talked about last episode were definitely practicing what we would today call magic. But to them, particularly the Egyptians, it was just how the world worked. It didn't necessarily require that you believe anything in particular to make it happen. The Egyptian word for magic was Heka, the same name they gave to their god of magic. 
but they were very clear about the fact that you didn't need to believe in Hekka or perform any particular ritual to Hekka in order to access it as magic. The principles of it were available to anyone who cared to take an interest. Magic worked on you or for you whether you believed or not, and no matter who you were, where you were from, or even if you were alive or dead. Especially if you were dead. Anyone could do it, use it, and benefit from it. However, when it comes to the next step in the history of magic, you had to be very, very careful. And so do we. Because suddenly the history of magic gets very, very complicated, and also very, very secretive, and very, very restricted, and not for the consumption of just anyone. You had to be a special sort of person to even think and talk about magic, let alone use it. First, though, as I often do when dealing with subjects that are very complex, I must issue a caveat. By no means are we going to go as deep as we should do if we were going to cover this particular topic thoroughly and exhaustively. You're getting an overview of the subject, enough so that you can understand what we are talking about in a general way, but not so much that the topic has been entirely explained and all the nuances have been accounted for. If you're one of those few folks who run across a topic you know something about, and you happen upon a bit of information that makes you want to write an email that starts with, yes, very good, but actually, maybe don't. Keep in mind that these explanations are for a general audience, and not someone who has done virtually any amount of research and reading on the subject. And even then, practical experience may still trump your reading and research anyway. Be that as it may, Never take what you learn on this show at face value. I get things wrong or misspeak or misunderstand all the time. I'm happy to hear a gentle clarification, correction, or amplification, but always assume there is a lot more to know. And if it interests you, go out and know it. The first thing to know is that the ancient kingdom of Judea was an area given to Judah, one of the sons of Jacob. Jacob, who would later be called Israel, and from whom the Jewish faith would arise. In Judea, while much fighting and enslavement and releases from enslavement, see our 2020 holiday special part two for the story of Esther, Esther, for but one example which involves Xerxes, about whom also an episode, and then re-enslavement, and then Romans, and wars with Romans, and then Byzantines, and then various and assorted crusades, fought for one thing and another pretty much at the whim of a succession of popes and kings who had trouble paying for things, there arose, alongside the Jewish faith, a tradition of Jewish mysticism. And that's about 81 words to convey something like 26 or 27 centuries of historical stuff. Now, Jewish mysticism encompasses a whole variety of things, not all of which are germane to the present discussion, but about some of which you do need to know in order to have some context for the bits that do apply. See, Jewish mysticism was kind of an on-again, off-again deal for much of Jewish history. It never entirely went away, but its prominence would ebb and flow during different periods. Some periods assigned a greater or lesser importance to it, depending on how Judaism was doing at the time, what was going on in the world, and whether the Jews were even at home or not. Part of the problem with this approach is that it's hard to know when things start and stop, and such is the case with the bit of Jewish mysticism which most everyone has heard of in one form or another and with which we are concerned. I am, of course, talking about Kabbalah. See, according to some, Kabbalah goes all the way back to Adam and has therefore always been with and a part of humanity. Others say that it really comes from the little chat Moses had with God on Mount Sinai that resulted in the Ten Commandments and other rules for the Israelites to follow. And still others say that really it all comes from about the 12th century or so and is just linked to those earlier periods as a sort of justification for its existence. And of course, in order to sort all that out, we first have to figure out what Kabbalah is exactly because, unless you have made a particular study of it, you've probably got the wrong idea thanks to the way it is portrayed in popular culture. One of the things you might think you already know about Kabbalah, and therefore Jewish mysticism, is that around about the 2000s CE, 
Many celebrities suddenly took it up and became practitioners of Kabbalah as some sort of semi-spiritual awakening. Among the celebrities particularly involved was aging pop singer Madonna, who made no secret that she actively practiced it and was even some sort of notable expert on the topic. There are at least two, if not several many more, problems with this. First and foremost, genuine Kabbalah teaching and usage is closed and secretive. Not because anything terribly untoward is going on, but because by tradition, learning about Kabbalah is limited to those capable of separating the very spiritual source of practical Kabbalah from those of the realms of evil. See, it's too easy to have the wrong motives and the wrong inspiration when engaged in what amounts to traditional Jewish magic. You couldn't just do it anywhere for any reason. You needed the right circumstances, and you needed a full and complete understanding of Judaism and its teaching before you could even think about attempting it. Which meant, generally speaking, you had to be a Jewish male over 40 years of age with a deep understanding of why you weren't supposed to be doing Kabbalah at all in the first place. Which is one reason that the Kabbalah fad of the 2000s wasn't really about genuine Kabbalah. However, all that said, there are a few things to know about Jewish mysticism that have influenced the larger world of both theurgy and thaumaturgy. Judaism has strong prohibitions against most kinds of magic, but especially against what is called divination magic, magic with which to see or predict the future. And it's the usual thing we've learned about predictive magic over the years. Your favorite local GM will be happy to tell you it's unreliable and open to interpretation and all that sort of thing, so that when you get your vision of the future, you're never quite sure about what led up to it what the consequences might be, and even what it actually means. It's no good learning Uncle Tommy is going to die on a Tuesday if you don't know which Tuesday, why he's going to die, or what happens to the rest of the people in the car he was driving at the time. Also, from a certain point of view, divination can be thought of as trying to see and perhaps even influence or subvert the will of God. If you can know to any certain degree what God intends for the future, you might be able to work against it, and that's probably not a good idea. Maybe Uncle Tommy has to die on a Tuesday in order to prevent a box full of cute little puppies from dying on a Wednesday, and you making sure Uncle Tommy doesn't drive anywhere on any Tuesday means Wednesdays look really bad for cute little puppies everywhere. You monster. But the primary Hebrew religious text, the Tanakh, is full of all sorts of references to divination and soothsaying that show it was a pretty frequent practice in ancient Israel in spite of being forbidden. Particularly prominent was the prophetic dream or aniromancy. It was slightly more acceptable to have one of these sorts of dreams as opposed to other forms of divination, which is probably because so many of God's appointed prophets had them so regularly. It's hard to tell God that the thing he is making happen technically isn't allowed in his own religion and still be taken seriously by God. Prophets were forever falling asleep and having dreams inspired by God, all of them predictive of the future. For a time, it was God's primary way of conveying information in the Old Testament to those who had misstepped and fallen off the path of righteousness. Grab a prophet, put him to sleep, give him a dream or two, and quick as you like, you'd made your feelings known about that time your chosen people had decided they knew better than you did. Which, clearly, you being God and all, they did not. Take the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, for instance. One day, God decides he's had just about enough of the way Israel has been acting and looks up a guy named Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a priest in exile in Babylon. God puts him to sleep and starts the matinee showing of a set of dreams unlike almost anything else recorded in the Bible outside of Revelations. God spends most of the book of Ezekiel being very upset indeed about the way the people of Israel have more or less forgotten about him and all the neat things he did for them. They've started worshipping idols, ignoring God's laws, and doing other things very much guaranteed to get up God's nose. As a result... Ezekiel gets the full special effects cinematic trilogy version of God basically saying, I'm fed up to hear with these people and now it's time to settle things once and for all. There's weird, four-faced, four-winged creatures that don't move right. 
There's wheels within wheels within eye-filled rims that follow the creatures around. And there's even a great big warrior type whose lower body is flame and whose upper body is also flame but different. So much is going on that Ezekiel doesn't even know how to describe it all properly. But the big message is made very plain to him. God is extremely upset and is going to put a big hurt on the people of Israel. Anybody who doesn't toe the line is done for. But that's just the first dream. God keeps them coming until it's apparent just how angry he really is. He's going to destroy his own temple, which is where God has been more or less hanging out for all these years, which means he's also going to move out and deny his presence to Israel. And he's going to destroy Jerusalem as well. And because they had a hand in making things tough for Israel and putting them in their present position where they could screw up so badly, he's going to wipe out all the nations that surround Israel and have ever caused them problems while he's at it. Oh, and to make matters worse, at least as far as Ezekiel is concerned, God is going to make Ezekiel personally responsible for making sure everyone who needs to hear his message hears it. Because if Ezekiel fails to tell someone who needs to know what God is upset about that God is upset about it and doesn't warn them to change their ways, well, not only is it going to be that person's fault for doing all the bad stuff in the first place because they should have known better, God is going to punish Ezekiel as well for not telling them to shape up and thereby drop the not-so-subtle hint that now, right now, would be a good time to correct their ways before God really gets rolling. Fortunately, after all this is done, and assuming Ezekiel did what he was told to do, God is going to relax a little and let Israel recover. He'll cause a new temple to be built, and he'll move back in. He'll patch up the relationship with those who remained faithful, and things can go back to the way they were, when God and Israel had each other's best interests at heart. All of which, naturally, he explains to Ezekiel with more equally disturbing dreams. There's even a whole bit about a battlefield full of dead bones coming back to life that inspired that one song you know so well about how the bones of the body all fit back together. You know, dem bones. And you can see how this is all stuff you would want to know if you were a Hebrew. The problem with divination, though, was that anyone could claim to have had a prophetic dream and then tell you some crazy mixed-up story about it. But very few people actually did have those sorts of dreams. So Judaic law allowed for only one exception to the forbidden practice. You had to be right. If you were right, it was assumed your dream was sent from God, and therefore exempt from punishment. Everyone else was in quite a lot of trouble. Add in prohibitions against impure magic and so on, and really, Jewish practical Kabbalah never really got off the ground. It was minor background noise in the larger Jewish mystical tradition. Basically, the use of practical Kabbalah is forbidden, and its few practitioners are deeply steeped in Jewish tradition and practice. It's not some be-all, end-all solution to be bandied about by just anyone, simply because it's become fashionable and profitable which was yet another problem with the Kabbalah fad of the 2000s. Now, we've talked about Kabbalah before, of course. Those of you with long enough memories or recent enough listens through the back catalog will recall our discussion of golems, another piece of Jewish mysticism that cropped up in Dungeons and Dragons, and an episode about amulets, too. You can listen to those episodes for all the details, but there are two more things to call your attention to. Some of the teachings of Kabbalah have to do with incantations. An incantation generally relies on the repetition of powerful names of angels to call on higher powers for protection from and defense against evil influences, or to get them to do something for you. Like, maybe if you knew the true name of an angel, you could repeat it until that angel sent Uncle Tommy out on a drive on a Tuesday, presumably to get you to shut up and stop pestering them. Also, who likes Uncle Tommy anyway? But some names are so important that you shouldn't even think about writing them down, let alone saying them, because of the ways they could be used and the power behind them. Which is why you need to know about the Tetragrammaton. 
See, along with the prohibition against incantations by the usage of names, one name in particular stands out because it was prohibited not only from being spoken and used in incantations, but also from being completely written down. Unless you were a highly trained and purified priest, using the name in full was pretty much off limits to you. And it stands out all the more because it is used, or rather not used, all over the Hebrew holy book, the Tanakh. Or if you prefer, the Old Testament. It's the name of God. Now, it is true that the name is referenced all over the books of the Bible, testaments old and new. But it is also true that this presents a heck of a problem for translators of the original texts. See, the name, as written in the manuscripts that came to make up the Old Testament, was an abbreviated form known as the Tetragrammaton, and consisted of four Hebrew letters, which today in English get translated as Y-H-W-H, and are pronounced wrongly. But some of that wrongly is on purpose, and herein lies the problem. If you are Jewish, and if you were a Hebrew back then, you weren't supposed to pronounce it, so you had to make up other names you could pronounce, so that when you saw Y-H-W-H, you didn't just say nothing and distort the meaning of scripture, which it was also very important not to do. Instead, you had to look at the context of the usage and substitute in one of several options depending on what was needed. Now, there are a million and one things that need to be taken into account here. But what it boils down to, in the simplest, most reduced, least finessed way I can attempt it, is that you will likely have heard at least one of three or four different things used to refer to God, depending on your tradition of belief. YHWH is frequently translated as Adonai, Elohim, or Hashem, depending on whether you are addressing God directly, referring to God, or simply mentioning God in everyday conversation. And the problem is, if you are translating the Old Testament out of Hebrew and into English, there aren't really English equivalents for those things. So what you end up with in English is either God, the Lord, the Lord God, or some other euphemistic referral to Him by means of His works, like the Giver of Life, the Almighty, and so forth. All of which, naturally, engender some confusion in English as you read your Bible about which aspect or qualities of God you are referring to at any given time, which can make those verses a bit tricky to properly understand. And, while we're on the subject, there is a way to pronounce the tetragrammaton. It's guaranteed to be pretty much incorrect, too, because the important thing to know about the tetragrammaton, and quite a lot of other ancient Hebrew writing as well, is that it leaves out all the vowels. You have to use the words around the word you're looking at and the overall context of what you are reading to work out which vowel should be filled into the word to make it complete. And in the case of YHWH, there are at least two options, and no one is quite sure which is correct, if either of them are. However, most people agree to work with the pronunciation of Yahweh when the tetragrammaton is encountered. Unless, of course, you decide that those letters weren't pronounced that way and you want to do things your own way and so went with a more literal Yehovah, which, thanks to Latinization, became Jehovah, which is almost certainly entirely wrong, even considering that no one is really sure what it should be in the first place. There's a lot more to it than that, of course, but that's where we're going to stop for now. Just know that names were considered to have power, and the names of powerful divine beings even more so. So, to recap, Jewish mysticism, as encapsulated by practical Kabbalah, included but was not limited to divination by dreams called aneromancy, incantations usually centered on the repeated use of names of powerful beings, and if you include our episodes on golems and amulets, bits of alchemy and protective magics. But there is one more aspect of it to discuss. See, a lot of Kabbalah was more or less based on what we call folk magic. That is, the sort of magic practiced by the people on the ground, as it were. As we explained last episode, if we're to accept the terms high and low magic, 
folk magic would be of the low variety. The kind of magic that keeps the cows giving milk if you remember to feed them, keeps the roof on the house if you remember to patch it, and makes sure the baby comes safely if you remember to boil the herbs and wipe them on the mother. Most people now would call them folk remedies, because what they are really is practical application of a bit of common knowledge. You may not understand completely how it works, but you know that it does. It's another appearance of the one extra fact, and the Kabbalah is full of all sorts of these folk remedies. For instance, you and I and everyone else knows that if someone in the house is feeling a bit under the weather, there is a very simple magic potion you can make to help them feel better. It goes a little something like this. Get a large pot of water and set it to simmering. Add in as much of the carcass of one chicken as you prefer. Bring to a boil and then allow to simmer for an amount of time between one hour and several, depending on how you like the end result. Strain out all the bones and some of the fat. Add solid root vegetables, garlic, onions, celery, and more until satisfied something resembling a balanced meal is floating around in there, and let it simmer some more until at least some of them are softer. Add salt, various herbs if you like, and some starch in the form of noodles, rice, or matzah. Give all that time to do its thing, heap it into a bowl with some saltine crackers on a little plate next to it, and serve to whomever is ill, and to everyone else in the house as a preventative. It's virtually guaranteed to have them feeling much improved in short order. And you can tell this is real, pure magic, and not just some basic household cooking of chicken soup. Because the one extra fact that no one really knows is exactly how it works. It's been studied and tested and examined six ways from Sunday, but still, nobody knows why it works or how. But it does. And that's why it's called Jewish penicillin. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. It's a new year, in case you'd somehow failed to notice that in the last week or so, and that means resolutions and changes. Although, it is well known I dislike resolutions. Fortunately, I haven't made any. What I have done, though, for my own sanity and peace of mind is entirely disengaged from social media. At least, the sort of social media I don't have more direct control over. So don't look for me to be posting anything on your favorite Twitter, nor Blue Sky. Each is as bad as the other at this point. If you want to get a hold of me for some reason, feel free to use email. Or find the pretty obvious link to my personal Discord. That's it. Those are your options. I can't in good conscience hang out anywhere else at this point, and it has certainly done wonders for my focus so far. Well, you could also head over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback and leave a message there. Or grab a membership and make use of the message board there. I mean, you might as well, and it would certainly be a grand way to show your support of the show. Even as little as $2 a month helps. Go on! you know you want to. This episode is a Fiddleback production and was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Find more episodes at gmwordoftheweek.com. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions, home of minimalist acoustic music for production and pleasure. Visit them at sessions.blue. A little science, a little magic, a little chicken soup.